Oliver Twist, by Charles Dickens, adapted by Lisa Malaki, illustrated by Howard McWilliam. Part Nine, Chapter Seventeen. Oliver learns the truth. Two days after the death of Sykes, Oliver was headed back to the town in which he was born. In the coach with him were Mrs. Maylie, Rose, Mrs. Batwin, and Doctor Lospin. Following behind was Monks and Mr. Brownlow. See there! cried Oliver. That is the hedge I crept under. See that house? That is where Dick lives. You love him, Rose. We'll take him away from here. He will grow strong with someone who loves him. Maybe he will live in the country. Maybe he will live with us. Rose nodded her head. She was overcome with happiness to see such joy in Oliver. As they approached the town. Oliver saw many other familiar sights, such as sourberries and the dreary workhouse. The coach led them off at a fancy hotel for an evening feast. At nine o'clock, Mr. Lawson and Mr. Grimwick joined them, followed by Mr. Brownlow and the strange man whom Oliver had seen many times. It was the man with purple lips. And sores on his hands. Monks sneered at the boy. This is a painful task, but one that must be done," said Mr. Brownlow. He pushed Monks forward to Oliver. "This here is your half brother, Monks. He told me a tale that he will now tell to you, Oliver." Oliver could barely breathe. He held on to Rose's hand and squeezed it tight. Monks started to talk. Listen up, Oliver is my half brother. My father became ill and died in Rome. When he died, my mother, whom he long divorced, found two papers that were meant for Mister Brownlow. One paper was a letter to Agnes. Agnes was your mother, Oliver. The letter was to remind Agnes that he had given her a locket with her name inscribed. No last name was engraved, so his name would go on it once she accepted his marriage proposal. There was a ring of gold inside the locket. What was the second letter? Asked Mister Brownlow. It was a will, said Monks. A will that my mother told everyone did not exist. It slapped my mother and me each eight hundred pounds. His property was to be divided between my mother and Agnes. If the child Agnes carried was a boy, he would get an inheritance only if he remained good and pure. No evil could befall his heart. If he broke the law or brought dishonor to the family name, he would get nothing. That is why," said Brownlow. Monks here wanted to turn Oliver into a criminal. He used Fagin for this. If Oliver was sent to jail, he would have the inheritance all to himself. Monks continued. In his letter to Agnes, he said he wanted to marry her since she was with child. It would hide her shame. He reminded her of the gift of love he had given her. He begged her to wear the locket close to her heart and prayed it would one day have his last name next to her first. As Oliver listened, tears ran down his face. My mother said, "Monks, burnt the will, and the letter never reached Agnes. But Agnes told her father the truth about the unborn child." Because of his shame, he fled with her and his other daughter to Wales. But Agnes felt so much shame that she abandoned her young sister and father. She ran away and had the baby in the workhouse. Her father thought she had died, and never knew if she had the baby. 
Mr. Brownell continues the story. When Monks was eighteen, he stole from his mother. He fled to France. When his mother was near death, she came to see me. She wanted to find Monks and forgive him. She wanted to bring him home. She finally find me in France," said Monks. "I came home, and she shared all of these secrets with me. She believed a boy had been born to Agnes, as she laid on her deathbed. I promised her I would find this child, hunt him down, and bring evil to him. If I found him, I'd drag him to the gallows myself." Everyone gasps. No. What happens to the locket and the ring? Asked Mister Brownlow. You know, I got them from a man and a woman," said Monks. "The woman found a pawn ticket on Agnes's nurse's dead body. They were now at the bottom of a river where I put them. At that moment, Grimwick, a changed man, brought in Mister and Missus Bumble. At first. They denied the story. Then two old nurses were let into the room. They were the nurses tending to Sally before she died. The first one spoke to Mrs. Bumble. We heard Sally speaking to you. We saw you take something from her hand. We followed you to the pawn shop. We saw you get the gold locket and ring. Mrs. Bumble put her hands up to shoot the ladies. We confess, but if that coward didn't confess, she pointed to Monks. No one would have known. Mr. Grimwick ushered the Bumbles out of the room. You two shall never work in the workhouse or have a position of power again. Mr. Brownell put his arm around Rose. You are about to hear something that is shocking. Do not be afraid. He turns to Monks. Do you know who this woman is? Monks nodded. Of course. Rose shook her head. But I do not know you. I've never seen you before. He laughed a mocking laugh. <laughs> do you remember? When I said that Anna's father had two daughters, they both went to Wales with him. The father died of a broken heart after Agnes left. The second daughter was very young. The little girl was cared for by two country people. When they died, an older woman took pity on her and adopted her. Where is she now? Asked Mister Brownlow. Monk signed. <sighs> right in this room, it is Rose. Mrs. Mary hugged Rose as Rose wept. Oliver squeezed Rose's hand once again. You are my aunt, Rose. You are my aunt. Just then, Harry rushed into the room. Rose, you made me a promise not too long ago. Will you marry me? I love you. Now that I know of my entire past," said Rose, "I am even more unworthy of your love." No," said Harry. "If my world cannot be yours, I will make your world mine. I want nothing of those who look down on me. I only want your love." Their two worlds would soon become one. Chapter Eighteen, A Final Note. The courtroom was packed with townspeople, awaiting Figgins' verdict. Figgins stood in front of the jury. Not a sound could be heard. He studied the faces of the jury. He couldn't see an ounce of sympathy in any of them. Guilty! Shouted the judge. The building ran out with tremendous shouts and groans. He was sentenced to die on Monday. He would go to the gallows. Upon hearing the verdict, Oliver said a prayer for Fagin. 
Mr. Brownlow went to see him. You have proof as to Oliver's identity," said Mr. Brownlow. "We must have those papers." "I have no proof," said Fagin. Mr. Brownlow sighed. "It's over. Syke is dead. Nancy is dead. Monks has confessed to everything. You are to die." Give back the boy's good name to him. Fagan showed some remorse as he told Mister Brownlow where to find the papers. As to the rest of the characters, the story is coming to a close. Within three months, Rose and Harry married in the village church, and that's where they lived their lives. Harry took over the duties of the church. They made it a happy home. Mrs. Mady lived with them and stayed there for the remainder of her days. Monks and Oliver split the property that was left to them. It was worth more than three thousand pounds each. Although Oliver has the rights to all of it, Mr. Brownlow wanted Monks to have the opportunity to turn his life into an honest one. Oliver agrees to the terms. Monks never giving up his new name. Lost all his money and quickly fell back to his criminal ways. He died in prison. The rest of Fagin's gang went to prison, with the exception of Charlie Bates. Appalled by the crime Sykes committed, he decided that an honest life was the best life. He struggled, but in the end, succeeded and made a favorable impression to all he came to know. The Bumbles never regained any status, and had to live like paupers in the same workhouse they ruled over. Once the tormentors of the poor, now they were the poor. Mister Brownlow adopted Oliver, Missus Batwin, Mister Grimwick, and Doctor Lossman were always in Oliver's life. Everyone moved on to the land that Harry and Rose built their house upon. Within the grounds of the village church, near Oliver's home, stands a white marble tablet. It bears just one word: Agnes. It was built to honor a mother who loved her child, if even for a few brief moments. That child, Oliver Twist, visited the tablet each day to honor the mother he never knew, but loved with all his heart. Thank you for watching. This is the end of the story. If you like this story, please like, share, and subscribe. By the way, there are many interesting stories on this channel. Don't forget to check it out. See you again.